Well, many women have a family history of breast cancer, and for a long time there has been interest in really understanding the genetic details of that family history. And it's obviously very important, both for helping a patient understand why she might have gotten breast cancer, and also for helping her understand what her risk of developing might, uh, breast cancer might be if there's a family history. So if your mom had breast cancer, you want to know, uh, do I have a much greater risk of developing breast cancer? And the interesting thing is that while many people have a family history, most women do not have hereditary breast cancer. So out of 100 cases of breast cancer that we see in the clinic, probably no more than five at the most 10, depending on where you practice and the specific community you live in, only a small minority of those women truly have hereditary breast cancer with a genetic predisposition. So this is something that a lot of people worry about and are understandably concerned about, but it only accounts for a small minority of cases of actual breast cancer. Beginning in the 1970s and 80s, there were elaborate genetic studies to try and look for chromosomal linkages that began to account for breast cancer in families. Mary Claire King at University of Washington was really the pioneer in this field and deserves tremendous credit for moving it forward. And her work and work of her colleagues around the country and really around the world led to the identification of two of the most important genes, the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes. These genes were easier to identify because they were clearly very powerful at increasing the risk of developing breast cancer. One of the interesting things about the genetic testing as we move into the next wave is that we are finding more and more genes, but many of them have what we call a lower penetrance, by which we mean that even if you have the gene, you're not quite so likely to get breast cancer. Not true for BRCA1 and 2, where you have somewhere between a 60 and 80 lifetime, a 60 and 80 percent lifetime chance of developing breast cancer, so highly penetrant genes. So that work led to the identification of these genes and eventually led to the commercialization of testing, which has been extraordinarily helpful for patients um, in thinking about several things. The first is that in a woman who has breast cancer, she wants to understand why she got it. And it's very powerful to be able to do the genetic testing and to say, you know, there is a hereditary mutation, this accounts for it, or conversely, there is not. The second thing is for family members of affected women because they want to know what their risk is if a sister, if a daughter, if a mother has developed breast cancer. And for them, this is very powerful information. It's not always easy information. Sometimes they find out things they weren't planning on dealing with in life. And many of us have had families where, you know, some of the siblings have the mutation and some of them don't, and it feels like a very unfair genetic lottery. So that raises issues, but at least you have the information. And um, for many women who have a family history, but not quite such an elaborate family history, you know, they have a maternal aunt who had breast cancer or a paternal cousin, uh, this information, again, can often be uh, reassuring to help people really understand why this is happening to them and what their risks moving forward might be. One of the questions that women ask us all the time when they're diagnosed with breast cancer is, I can deal with this, but I don't want to have to have my kids deal with this. And so another role of the genetic testing is to reassure that patient that the uh, breast cancer isn't going to be something that her family is going to have to deal with generation after generation. There was a very interesting piece in the New York Times this past week by Gina Collada where she was talking about genetic testing. And she pointed out some of the pitfalls of genetic testing. And I, I know you'll get into this in the program today. But the interesting thing is that while there are pitfalls, for the vast majority of women, the information is really reassuring. Remember that before you had genetic testing, you had 100% of the time uncertainty about whether this was a truly hereditary breast cancer or not. And now, 95% of the time, we can give women very good reassurance that they either do have, in 5% of the cases, a hereditary predisposition, or in 90% of the cases, really don't. And that information has a lot of clinical implications and really affects the way people feel about the disease. So the goals for genetic testing for risk assessment in breast cancer, and even other cancers, but we'll focus on breast here, uh, are really to kind of inform uh, a patient, in this case a woman with breast cancer, or even a man with, with potential breast cancer, um, what their risk of new cancer will be. Uh, so if a woman does present with breast cancer, I mean there's several ways of doing this. If a woman presents with breast cancer um, and actually fits the criteria potentially for genetic testing, and uh, there are many criteria that we use, 
uh, summer and evolution. Um, but basically, if someone does fit those criteria, um, it can guide kind of what surgical procedure she has because maybe potentially if she is kind of uh, uh, positive for one of these somatic mutations or germline mutations, um, uh, she may have a higher risk of breast and or other cancers. Uh, and therefore, she may elect to have more extensive surgery, may elect to have an oophorectomy, or may elect to have certain screening procedures. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, at least it's, it's for women with breast cancer to guide what kind of surveillance and what kind of actual surgical procedures they'll get. In addition, it's also for people at risk for cancer who don't have cancer at all. And that's really to help them with screening and or prophylactic um, surgical procedures. And I think that um, the precision that we've gained in the last probably decade or two uh, really has changed uh, uh, the way we manage patients. So the question is who should be tested? And, and that's straightforward in some cases. In other cases, it's somewhat more complex. So obviously, if somebody is a close family member of somebody who is known to carry a deleterious mutation, they, they should be referred for genetic risk evaluation and, and for testing. Um, and then if we're just looking at individuals who do not belong to hereditary breast cancer families, if you have a woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 50 or a triple negative breast cancer under the age of 60, even in the absence of any family history, that's an indication for referral for, for risk evaluation. Um, any male breast cancer patient, if somebody's of Jewish descent and they have ovarian cancer or pancreatic cancer or breast cancer, that's an appropriate candidate. And then you're really looking at more complex constellations of, of family history where if you have cases of younger age of onset of breast cancer or multiple family members or families where there's both breast and ovarian cancer, all of those things come in together. The good news is that there are some guidelines out there that are pretty easy to look up and to follow if you're not sure. So NCCN has, has some easy and, and well accessible guidelines that can help uh, people understand who should be referred for, for risk evaluation and testing.